One. He is a fighter. He spent all his life fighting. What was I supposed to do on the square? And what was the parachute commando regiment on a BMD-1 with a full complement of ammunition supposed to do? But soon, Ledbet will order his soldiers to attack in a similar situation. Ledbet became a hero for everyone in Transnistria. The army is sometimes trapped in political games. That Congress nominated Lebed as a presidential candidate. This is an image of an imperial general, a peacemaker with fists. Drop right now. This was a fairy tale for 50 million voters. No one had ever seen an election campaign of such a scale in the region. Elaine Delon came to support General Lebed. Lebed's staff was constantly in a state of turmoil. Go fuck yourself. Record this too. Alexander Lebed, the governor of Krasnoyarsk Krai, has been killed. I can venture a guess that there was something else at play. Lebed thought that he could only come back a winner, and he would only become the winner if the military action stopped. What do you think? Being a general with combat experience, did he really take a pacifist stance at that time? Hello, my friends. We're in Krasnoyarsk. It's quite cold here. This installment is more personal for me than usual. That's because here, exactly 25 years ago, time flies, huh? In the building of the hotel where we were staying, my career of a political reporter started. I was working for NTV at the time, and I came here to cover the gubernatorial elections with a famous star running. This person took third place in the presidential election a couple of years prior. Everyone knew his name. If during the first round of elections, 20 news crews were running around, there were twice as many on the 17th of May. The press explained the commotion in one word. Lebet. Welcome to another installment of Person of the Day. Today, we invited Alexander Lebet, the general. We welcome Alexander Lebed here at Rush Hour. Good evening. Good evening. I met Alexander Lebed myself that day. I interviewed him several times. I remember how I was drawn to him because he was nice and charismatic. Even though politically I was a bigger fan of his adversary, Valery Zubov, who was the governor at the time. Lebed won these elections. He became the governor of Krasnoyarsk. Four years later, he died in a helicopter crash that gave rise to a lot of conspiracy theories. Our subscribers asked me to film an installment about Lebed last year. And the reason is obvious. The general seems relevant again. A military officer, a general who served in several armed conflicts. He stopped two wars, at least that's how everyone puts it. First the one in Transnistria, then the first Chechen war. Lebed was the one who signed the Khazavyurt Accord in 1996 that ended the first Chechen war. It's still the subject of heated disputes. Some say that there was no other choice back then. Others say that it was treason. Last year, a clip from an interview with Lebed went viral on the internet. He was interviewed in 1996 for NTV's Person of the Day. Different wars, even if they last for centuries, end with one thing, negotiations and peace. I ask myself, 
Is it worth tons of corpses, widows, orphans, crippled people, letting the work of dozens of generations before you go to waste, just to sit down and make peace? How did a military general arrive at these pacifist views? How did Lebed even get into politics? How did he run in the presidential elections and the ones here in Krasnoyarsk? Who stood behind him? Who financed him? Did these people and Lebed himself achieve their goals? Why did his political career, which seemed to be leading him to the president's chair in the Kremlin, end here in Krasnoyarsk with such a tragedy? Today, we will try to answer these questions. Of course, I won't rely on only my own memory. We managed to find quite a lot of witnesses and participants in the drama called General Lebed. Russia is tired. It's tired of political turmoil, wars and empty promises, theft and pillaging. We need peace, order and stability. We've had enough wars, I promise that. Every time a revolutionary process unfolds, I think about classic examples like the French Revolution. In every revolution, there comes a Bonapartist reactionary moment, an urge for a Bonaparte. And here he is, the perfect candidate for the role of Bonaparte, with his graceful mannerisms and deep voice and his ability to tell witty and acerbic jokes like a real general. But not corny jokes. They were very convincing. That's history for you. You can take part in it voluntarily or by force but you need to end it beautifully. Lebed showed up when there was a need for a third power. On the one hand, there were the communists, who represented the archaic past we rejected. Then there was the new democratic leadership that was initially supported. Then, due to heavy-handed economic reforms, social divisions and disillusionment, because democracy didn't bring social justice and increased social welfare, they also became a disappointment. There is a lot of put-on romanticizing around Lebed, myths that only their creators like. A larger-than-life persona will always be surrounded by myths, rumors and gossip, and he will be unaware of them. The speculations he never planned to refute. He did what he did, and then, I can repeat, General Lebed is the hero of the period he lived in. Drop right now, on the count of three, already two. Yes, sir! Did you come up with drop right now? <laughs> no, I didn't. But it was in puppets. The actors were improvising. Sometimes it looked good, other times it was a disaster. And drop right now uh, is a normal, brutal military phrase. <laughs> it's not even a joke. Drop, know your place. I'm the boss. You're a fool. It became a quote. And we owe it to Lebed's political intuition. It was in the puppets. He heard it and made it in his campaign slogan. Because I saw calendars with this phrase on them. Uh, who did you vote for? For the great general Lebed. His name is so striking. His words are so beautiful. I voted for Lebed this time. I've got no faith in Yeltsin. I've got this uh, question slash uh, wish for Alexander Ivanovich. Will his uh, character and uh, willpower, I, I've got a wish. Alexander Ivanovich, don't let them make you a toy in their hands. I, I wish that you won't do malicious deeds. 
That was a wish. I thank you. He is trying his best. Next call. Lebed definitely wasn't the person he wanted to seem to be. This enormous gorilla with a deep bass voice was a fairy tale for 50 million voters. Alexander Lebed was born in Novochikovsk into a working-class family. His father, Ivan Andreevich, was Ukrainian. He lived through two wars and the Gulag. Lebed wrote in his memoirs that his father was sent to a labor camp for being five minutes late for work two times. My father was born in a village called Terny in the Sumy region in Ukraine. Half of this village was populated by people called Lebed, but not all of them were related. Elsewhere, it's Ivanov or Petrov. In our case, it was Lebed. His mother, Yekaterina Grigorovna, was a Don Cossack. She worked at the Novochikovsk Telegraph all her life. Lebed also had a younger brother, Alexei. He will also join the military and then become a governor. We'll see more of him in this film. A curious detail, Alexander Lebed was registered as Russian, but Alexei as Ukrainian. They say it was a common practice in mixed families with two children. There is the central thoroughfare, Moscow Street. It branches out into Garbatia, then Sverdlov Street. Now it's named after Alexander Ivanovich Lebed. A tiny yard, nothing special. My father lived there from the time he was seven. Moreover, he went to the same school as Lebed. I should say they were problem children, as they used to say. The guys in Novichokask were quite dashing. Imagine a 12-year-old boy who lives in a small town in the provinces, where everyone knows everyone. Well, almost everyone at least. They grow up together, play in each other's houses, and before his eyes, his neighbors from that house die. At the age of 12, Lebed witnessed the most horrible event of Khrushchev's Thor, here on the central square. It was a square back then, now it's a garden square. On the 2nd of June 1962, a workers' protest was fired upon. A day before that, the party leadership announced they'd increase prices for goods in shops because of the trade deficit in the country. The situation got worse because the board of the locomotive factory in Novocherkask announced a decrease in employees' salary. The employees were outraged by that because they had no idea how to go on. But the head of the factory, Boris Kurochkin, replied, If you don't have enough money for meat pies, just get giblet pies. They pestered him, asking him to solve this or that problem. He didn't care about day-to-day -day life, he only cared about the technology. That's why, I want to be clear, he most likely, I'm sorry for the rude language, he told them to buzz off. I think they came up with this phrase to put it mildly. The leaders didn't even want to have a proper talk with them. No explanations, no attempts to calm them down. No one did that, and this hot mess appeared. Who called the shots? It was Major General Oleshka, the head of the Novocherkask military garrison. The second question, and it's extremely controversial, is the extent to which the special divisions of KGB participated in this. It's obvious they did. Unfortunately, this matter is still closed. My mother told me, children were sitting in trees. 
They did that to get a better view. They became the target of the first volley. They shot at the chestnut tree where I was sitting. Two boys were hit and fell down. The army shot them on the street. And, of course, it impacted him for the rest of his life. I heard a few phrases about that from him in person. What phrases? That it drove a wedge between him and the government for forever. He never stood against it until it fell. Yet, that was when he got disappointed in it forever. In the government in general or with the Soviet government? The Soviet government. He didn't say Soviet, but there was no other government back then. By the end of 1990, almost all the Soviet republics declared their sovereignty. Gorbachev was trying to maintain a united state, at least formally. He was doing that with the help of negotiations. So, on 20th of August 1991, he wants to sign an accord between Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Azerbaijan and five states in Central Asia. A lot of politicians in the country stood against signing such a contract between nine out of 15 republics. One of them was Gennady Yanayev, the vice president and also all security officials, including the Minister of Defense and the head of KGB. They decided to take over and take power out of Gorbachev's hands. You know the rest. 19 August 1991, Gorbachev was in his residence in Foros, Crimea. The State Committee on the State of Emergency was created, and by order of Yazov, the Minister of Defense, they led armored vehicles into the capital and blocked all the strategic facilities. That included the building of the Supreme Soviet of the Russian SFSR. The office of newly elected president of the Russian SFSR, Boris Yeltsin, was in that building. The White House. That's where Alexander Lebed was called. He was on vacation, but he got an urgent call. His task was to head to Moscow with three groups from the 106th Airborne Guard Division and get to the Tushino airfield. That was it. No details. Lebed arrived at the airfield and had no idea what was going on. Still perplexed, he got an order to head to the White House and have the battalion provide security for it. In his memoirs, he wrote that since there were no announcements by the State of Emergency Committee and he didn't get any orders, when he got here and talked to the citizens who were building barricades, he saw that these were ordinary, kind-hearted people, he wrote. So, am I supposed to provide security and defense for the Supreme Soviet building with the help of the battalion? We will do that with these people, with the folk. Then there was the question, defense against whom? I urge you, first and foremost, to remain calm. Don't provoke the military in any way. Lebed learned about the coup and the members of the state committee near the White House. He was told that Yeltsin himself was waiting for him. He wanted to talk. He left behind a lot of memories about that moment. Yeltsin asked Lebed about the opinion of the armed forces about the coup. Lebed said there was no opinion because they didn't know anything about it. Shortly after, Yeltsin held a meeting and announced that the Airborne Guard Division commanded by Lebed was on the side of the people. Then, in August 1991, a myth about General Lebed taking Yeltsin's side was born. We should say that Lebed always denied these rumors, even when Yeltsin was in power. He said he didn't take anyone's side, he was just following orders. This Airborne Guard Division's battalion that surrounded the White House seemed quite nice. The soldiers befriended the civilian defenders of the White House. They brought them food and drink. They even provided them with radio receivers so they could hear what was going on. Echo Moskva was functioning at the time. Everything seemed peaceful. Peaceful. 
On 20th August, early in the morning, Lebed was ordered to withdraw the troops from the House of Soviets. On the same day, he was called by Dmitry Yazov, the Minister of Defense, who said, I was told you had shot yourself. The general replied, I see no reason for that, sir. In two days, a rumor appeared about Lebed being held captive by the White House defenders. I remember those days. There was horrible, absolute chaos, no sign of normal communication. Information could develop and change several times per hour, let alone per day. He said he had a, an order to withdraw. The, the regular troops had to, to leave. No one had to defend the rebels. I said, doesn't look good. And he said, you see, I'm an officer. I gave an oath once. I was ordered to leave you. Lebed reported to the airborne commander Pavel Grachev that any use of force near the Supreme Soviet building would lead to a massive bloodbath. But what's important, he didn't refuse to follow such an order if he received it. The battalion under Lebed's command had a task. The storming presupposed that the airborne troops would move the barricades away and break the ring of people around the White House. Then the vehicles would ram the doors and windows. There was no fence at the time. Then the airborne battalions would enter and simultaneously the Alpha Group would storm the building from the roof and the basements. Everything looked impressive and horrifying. Levitt accepted the order and headed out there at night. He put people out there and looked at what was going on. They were doing reconnaissance and waiting for orders. Everyone was waiting for the storming of the White House to happen on the night between the 20th and 21st of August. It was supposed to be carried out by Alpha Group, but according to the most widespread version, the soldiers refused. That was a hectic night. A large group of the White House defenders tried to block a column of military equipment here at the Garden Ring. It later turned out that it was led by Captain Sorovikin, the future general. Nowadays, his name is widely known. Blood was shed and it became clear the situation had entered a critical phase. The airborne commander, Pavel Grachev, never ordered his subordinates to storm the White House. The very order Lebed said he would follow. However, the State Committee on the State of Emergency fell the following day, and the legend that Lebed immediately took the side of the White House defenders in 1991 took on a life of its own. They asked Lebed directly, were you ready to follow that order? He said, yes, I was. What do you think would happen if you'd followed it? His answer was, we would have taken 30 or 40 minutes to complete the task because there were almost no weapons on their side, only small arms. And of course, he said, there would have been hundreds, if not thousands of dead people for sure. So he didn't face any moral dilemma, judging by his testimony. At that moment, he didn't. But starting from that moment, he apparently began to change. Surprisingly, even his Novocherkask trauma was suppressed at that moment. In 1967, after finishing high school, I tried to enter the aviation school, but I was unlucky. I got my nose broken, so I didn't get there. I went to work in a factory instead. My responsibilities were easy. I sanded flat magnets. I sanded them all day, a whole pile of them. At the end of the day, I realized I had fulfilled the task. Yeah. Then a strict and gorgeous looking woman came up to me and recommended that I tidy up my lathe. Then she got me. It seemed like Alexander's life was moving along a predictable track. He got married and entered the Ryazan Guard Higher Airborne Command School. Soon he became a deputy platoon commander. 
Lebed's commander in his third year was Lieutenant Pavel Grachow, future Minister of Defense, who will later have conflicts with Lebed and would lose his position partly because of him. For the time being, Grachow had the newly graduated Lebed command a platoon in the school. Lebed wasn't a big fan of that. Organization, paperwork and reports weren't his thing. He dreamt of serious deeds and a real service. Honestly, I was sick of school. I was craving something new. In response, they told me I was obsessed with my career and that I shouldn't leave after commanding a company for only two years. They proposed I spent at least one more year there and then talk about transferring. Destiny heard him. Three years later, Lebed got to his first war. In 1978, unexpectedly for the Soviet Union, another military coup took place in Afghanistan. That's when revolutionaries, as they called themselves, from People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, overthrew Daoud and brutally murdered him and his family. When the coup d'etat took place, none of the Soviet documents mentioned the word revolution. A military coup. Only a couple of months later it started to be called a revolution, because the representatives of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan who gained power stated that they were going to build socialism. Afghanistan, revolution. When the left-wing party gained power, Moscow definitely started to support them. It began to support them. The Afghani revolutionaries gained power without difficulties. Little did they know it was hard to keep it. Islamic fundamentalists fought with armed force. Uprisings took place in one region after another. Afghani leadership was seriously concerned they could lose their power. Then, in March 1979, they asked Moscow to send Soviet troops to Afghanistan. A cliché, providing strategic interests, was coined. But no one could explain it properly then, and it's still a mystery as to what it means. No one has ever known what these strategic interests are. The workers and peasants' Red Army was fighting in Afghanistan. Children of workers and peasants. Doesn't matter who he is. Private, major, colonel. No one saw the sons of high-ranking parents. And the soldiers did fulfill their duty. They didn't win that war. They simply couldn't. The situation wasn't fitting. There was no Moscow or Russia behind their backs, but they didn't lose either. They were poorly prepared, that's a fact, because the Soviet troops' tactical training was different. Who did we, the Soviet army, prepare to fight with? With NATO, huge columns of tanks, huge divisions, infantries facing each other, they shoot and kill. 
In Afghanistan, it wasn't a highly technological war that the Soviet troops faced at the end of the 20th century. It was a guerrilla war. No one was ready for that. No one researched the realities of a guerrilla war. No one even looked into the experience of the war with the Basmachi movement in the 1920s. No one looked into the U.S. experience with the Vietnamese guerrillas. So they had to learn by trial and error in Afghanistan, on the battlefield. Living conditions and financial support for the battalion under my command leaves much to be desired. The bathhouse visit schedule was a mess, or it wasn't allowed at all. Bed sheets were either non-existent or rarely changed. As a consequence, a lice infestation happened. I went ahead and tried to solve this issue, because if you expect a human to serve you, you must provide him human conditions. If you treat him like a pig, what service do you expect in return? If we talk about the losses, both of the Soviet Army, KGB and Ministry of Home Affairs, the people who fought there, the losses were greater than 15,000. You would often hear that 15,000 in nine years out of 220 million people in the whole USSR isn't much at all. But I'm convinced that it's incorrect to speculate whether 15,000 is a lot or not. Take a family of three people, mother, father and a son. The son was drafted, he died. Is that a lot? Afghanistan is in pain, tears, and memory. It was a high price the soldiers paid for politicians' madness. I think by madness he meant the political decision to send the Soviet troops. When they got into it and started fighting, they had to look for a way out. It isn't the task of a military to give a political assessment. The decision to start or finish a military campaign isn't for them to make. That's why Lebed approached the situation like this. It was politically complex, maybe not thought through, but the military, including him, fulfilled their duties. In July 1982, Lebed was promoted to major early, left Afghanistan and entered the Frunze Military Academy. After that, he became the commander of the 331st Kostroma Airborne Guard Regiment. He participated in the parade on Red Square with the regiment. According to his memoirs, he remembered the grueling practices on the square rather than the parade itself. On arriving at the venue with the column, I once again confirmed that a festival for an officer feels like a wedding for a horse. Flowers on the face and soap in the ass. These, as they would say, masculine and vulgar army jokes were characteristic of Lebed. They later became an important feature of his political image. His service was going on well, and in 1986 he became a lieutenant colonel and a colonel in 1988, earlier than expected. He was appointed as the commander of the 106 Tula Airborne Guard Division. It was a memorable moment. Uh, the commander was doing an inspection. Mm, let's say it was um, Alexander Ivanovich Lebed at the time, as far as I can remember. He um, lined up all the officers for an inspection, and so on, and it rained. The officers naturally wore rainproof capes, but the soldiers didn't have them. 
He took his cape off and told the officers to do the same. They stooped to the level of the soldiers, but in a good way. The officers faced the same challenges as the soldiers, the rain in this case. That's my vivid memory, taking care of his personnel, and during these events that followed, including the hotspots. He was with us in Baku too. I'll tell you that he'd always take care of his personnel. Back then, I didn't know that my appointment coincided with the beginning of a new era in history. February and March 1988 marked a new, unpredictable, unexpected, sometimes wild and bloody, sometimes an utterly mean page in the history of airborne troops the history of my fatherland and of my personal biography. The end of the 1980s is, of course, the ethno-political awakening of Caucasus. Georgia was probably a pioneer there. Then there was Armenia, which realized that the center of the Union didn't support its zeal to unite with Nagorno-Karabakh, the so-called Miatsum, and started to seek independence. Azerbaijan also was thinking about independent development outside of the Soviet Union. In November 1988, Lebed's battalion was urgently transferred to Baku. The city faced mass protests. They called for Azerbaijan's secession from the Soviet Union. What was I supposed to do on the square? And what was the parachute commando regiment on a BMD-1 with a full complement of ammunition supposed to do? I was immediately surrounded by people. I didn't see animosity in their faces. I saw anxiety. Why did you come here? I bluntly replied, hell if I know. I heard you have unrest here. Everyone was passionately saying I was wrong. The rally was politically organized. I told them if they weren't doing anything, I wouldn't harm them either. The column would also be standing where it was. Then Lebed wrote that one of the generals, his name wasn't mentioned, gave an order to attack, to rush the square full of protesters and cordon off the House of Soviets. Had I followed his command faultlessly, I'd have provoked colossal bloodshed. Because there was only one way to attack with a crowd that dense. Cover everyone with armor, put the assault rifles into loopholes, prepare the machine guns, and start walking on corpses. I think I was quite succinct when I gave my opinion of his mental capacities. But soon, Lebed will order his soldiers to attack in a similar situation. On the 9th of April 1989, well-known events took place in Tbilisi. The Georgian activists and national intelligentsia already said, OK, then Georgia can secede from the Soviet Union too. On 9th April, Lebed's battalion was deployed to Tbilisi. The column entered the city at night. The protesters threw stones and rebar at the soldiers. Lebed commanded them to defend themselves. A while later, the phrase infantry spade emerged in all the media. That's what the airborne troops used against the protesters. A soldier could use such a spade, like a racket, to repel the stones and cover his face. 
Only later did they cook up articles about a spade being a deadly weapon that could be turned into a symbol of violence and high-handedness. Some spades might have been used for that, but I should say that there were no deaths or serious injuries and chop wounds. In Tbilisi, despite what they had written in the press, he didn't play an important role. The thing is that I was a part of Anatoly Sobchak's committee that looked into these Tbilisi events. I was the vice president of this committee. We investigated the matter thoroughly. We listened carefully to all the evidence of the participants of these events. At some point, a company of soldiers did take part in the events, but it was short. Leber didn't play any serious role back then. However, there was a second instance, January 1990, and a large number of Soviet troops were sent to Baku. There were clashes. Automatic weapons and armored personnel carriers were used. The losses were more significant, too. That's when Lebed showed himself as an envoy of Soviet power. There was a new wave of protests in Azerbaijan in 1990. On 17 January, in front of the building of the Central Committee, an indefinite protest started. The Union leadership tried to negotiate with that of the Republic. They couldn't. Hence, Gorbachev, the General Secretary, decided to apply force once again. Get lost, you party and state leaders. Instead of nipping the conflict in the bud, they let it burn. They'll prove how useless they are. Then they'll use us, their airborne magic wand. Taking over Baku with two million citizens is so nice and easy. The spades wouldn't work in Baku. They were shooting with assault rifles and machine guns. At people. At people, too. They tried shooting above their heads, at wheels and windows to raise fear. People were wounded, too. More than a hundred people died. His attitude towards it was ambivalent. He said, I'm a soldier, so I'll obviously follow all orders. I can't act as I please. But I doubted that that strategy was effective. He realized that the army is sometimes trapped in political games. No, the role of politics in Libet's life is only about to start. In 1992, he, a major general, a title he received after Baku, was sent to Transnistria. It became a hot spot, and that was his specialty. He was sent there for an inspection. The thing is that his brother, Lexi, commanded the 300th Airborne Guard Division that was based in Chisinau. Since they were in the city during these revolutionary events, they were surrounded by protesters. There were tents in a 24-7 blockade. It was clear that a conflict was brewing. They had to understand what to do with that event. So Alexander Ivanovich came to Transnistria with a special mission and expanded powers in order to come up with a bloodless solution.
This is the border between Moldova and Transnistria, an unrecognized republic on the left bank of the Dniester, which declared its independence from the Chisinau and deems itself a separate state. It is called a border in Tiraspol, the capital city of Transnistria. For Moldova's authorities, it is just an administrative boundary, so it just has a police post on the Moldovan side and a full-fledged border checkpoint on the Transnistrian side. In order to enter the republic, you need to present your passport and declare goods and currency if you are bringing them in. So what caused this border to appear? The disintegration of an enormous country was in full swing. National republics started the process of nationalist revival. New countries were being formed, leading to the Soviet Union's collapse. I believe that the language issue was one of the factors that made the protest movement more active. In 1989, the Moldovan parliament adopted a new law that recognized Moldovan as the only state language in the republic. Tiraspol, which was mostly Russian-speaking, was quite unhappy about it. It gave rise to protests and strikes at factories. Tens of thousands of citizens took part. If Moldova hadn't taken that nationalist step with only Moldovan being official, nothing would have happened. Everything would be okay. We, as parliament deputies, went to Tiraspol to discuss the matter and try to reach a consensus. But some didn't want to engage in a dialogue. They tried to use force to solve some of their problems the way they thought was right. The confrontation between the two banks of the Dniester were growing, and in 1992 it brought serious clashes and casualties. A full-scale armed conflict broke out. In June 1992, Major General Alexander Lebed arrived in Transnistria under the call sign Colonel Gusev. No one knows why Lebed had chosen that alias. He was a well-known officer at that moment. The soldiers recognized his face anyway. When Lebed arrived in Tiraspol, rumors about him being able to bring order were already circulating. Lebed became the commander of the 14th Guard United Army, which was in chaos at the time. I think he came because of the wave of polemics about Russians being humiliated in Transnistria, that they facilitate obliterating everything Russian. When he spent time here, I think he changed his opinion about who was guilty and what had been going on during the armed conflict. What role did the 14th Russian army play in this conflict? It initially was neutral. It didn't interfere with the conflict. But, on the first day of the war, I know that General Lebed, the commander of the 14th Guard Combined Army, reacted to the conflict very sharply. He told Moscow that the 14th Army had to step in between Moldova and Transnistria. It couldn't allow bloodshed. On the 19th of June, the Moldovan side crossed the Rubicon, so to say. It initiated warfare, dragged its equipment and troops. President Snegur decided to take control over the Transnistrian Republic. All the armoured equipment arrived. Intelligence reported that a large number of tanks, armoured cars and artillery had accumulated. And Lebed went ahead. At 3.30 a.m. they launched a 45-minute attack. There was a powerful artillery attack. Artillery and mortar strikes with tank guns. Long story short, they brought everything they could and launched a powerful deflective attack. 
After that, at 6 a.m., the Minister of Defense called. Of Moldova? No, Gratchev. He brutally railed at Lebed because he had never reported that he planned to attack. No one knew about it. There were no leaks. He called him down and said, Don't step away from the phone. The president is going to call you. Yeltsin called him and calmly told him to wrap it all up. Moldovan President Snegur and the Transnistrian President Smirnov are coming to see me. And we saw that the two presidents were drinking champagne in the Kremlin. The war was over. That was Lebed. But there were a lot of casualties from the other side. Of course. It took a whole month to transport them. In the end, the losses were grave. This flying wedge that was getting ready to attack dissolved. After that, Kishinev demanded negotiations, and they were held. They reached an agreement that changed format several times. After signing the agreement that resolved this conflict, Labed became a hero for everyone in Transnistria. And just so you know, I still have his portrait in my house. A lot of people in Transnistria still have Lebed's portrait at home. A shadow of fascism was cast on this blessed land. Genocide against their own people took place. Why, during the press conference, did Libet say that the authorities of Moldova were legally elected but fascist at the same time? He used that term constantly. By fascist, he meant forbidding the left bank and Gagauzia to speak Russian. You mean the Moldovan authorities did that? Yes, the Moldovan authorities did. Is that why Libet called it a fascist regime? Of course. The order he got along with his extended powers was worded in a curious way. Do not let a fratricidal war and a massacre of civilians happen. A fratricidal war means that you decide who is whose brother, from what side and to what extent. At that moment, he was an imperial peacemaker, no doubt. He left a great memory in the citizens of the Transnistrian Moldavian Republic because he stayed there in the summer of 1992 after these events. He even served as a deputy in their local Transnistrian parliament. As a deputy, he solved lots of conflicts, one after another. He tried to stop the illegal weapons trade. He entered a conflict, unmasked and punished the criminals. Then he started exposing corruption. Feels like he was fighting with himself. He came with one set of ideas, but when he experienced the local life, he started to change. In the end, he came to different conclusions. As far as Lebed is concerned, he does his job well. The general is just a little full of himself. He thought he really was that large of a figure. Grachev, the Minister of Defense, called Alexander Ivanovich and told him about reducing the army. Obviously, Lebed was up in arms. Grachev commanded, The order will arrive today. Tomorrow you are flying back to Moscow. In August 1994, a directive from the Minister of Defense arrived in Tiraspol. Disband the 14th Army, deadline 1st September. But Lebed, who had always followed orders, didn't comply this time. He refused to disband the 14th Army. What could they do? Force a popular general out of Tiraspol? 
No one was ready to do that in the Kremlin. They backed off. Yeltsin stated that they couldn't afford to escalate the situation in Transnistria. They tried a gentler way to lure Libid out of Tiraspol. They offered him a high position outside of the Republic, but Libid refused to leave his army once again. Moreover, when the first Chechen war started, he said that his soldiers would never take part in it. The situation was ambiguous. Libid continued his service. He commanded an army, but disobeyed the decision of the Minister of Defense and the Supreme Commander-in-Chief. So, de facto, he became a politician, something in between a military commander and a warlord. It was clear that Moscow wouldn't put up with that. In June 1995, Libid was prematurely placed in the reserves with the right to wear the military uniform and gratitude for his impeccable service. Libid made a decision, and he was well aware that he could be put in prison for it. He disobeyed the Supreme Commander's order. He had a political reason behind it. He'd already become a politician in Transnistria when he was investigating all those conflicts from the Parliamentary Tribune as a Transnistrian deputy. He had gotten some really serious support. That's what made the government worry. At that moment, he had graduated from the school of the young politician. And he got to Moscow with some experience under his belt. He must have had some thoughts he hadn't voiced publicly yet. In any case, he found himself in the Congress of Russian Communities quite soon. Here, at New Arbet Avenue 15, in that building that looks like a book, in the mid-1990s, Congress of Russian Communities had its office. It was a right-wing or even extreme right-wing social political movement. That's where, in April 1995, Lebed's direct political path started. He became vice chairman of the Congress under Yuri Skokov. He was the secretary of the Security Council before that. The Congress nominated Lebed as a presidential candidate. On 22 January 1996, the Central Election Commission registered that nomination. However, Lebed and Skokov had a fight later. Lebed said something unpleasant about Skokov, so a separate initiative group was created to nominate Lebed. But that's not important, and that was the official and public side of the matter. But on the informal and true side, just like these days, in order to become a real candidate for president of Russia, you need to solve a matter in the administration of the current president. His appearance was quite fortunate because the image of an imperial general, a peacemaker with fists, who was ready to impose just order, was a gift in this political situation. And, attention, it positioned itself as a third source of power. Don't you think we have a flank disease? Boris Nikolaevich, our current president, declared a war, a crusade against communism. The left flank is on the alert too. Their sentiments are almost the same. They also want to overthrow the current stuck-up ones. I just want to keep the peace and calm amidst all this. If, at some point, the whole world makes a flank blunder, I will invite you to join a guerrilla group. We'll have to be ready to fight. I don't think he was thinking about a bureaucratic career. He tasted power, and he realized he had an inner mission. Besides, he started to be surrounded by theorists who constantly fed him more knowledge. Apparently, the talk about Bonaparte attracted his attention. It looked like he had tried on that role in his heart. Today, we need to nip any possibility of armed conflict in the bud, stop the rise of criminality and the growing crisis. And I, a Russian officer, know how to do this. We were offered the opportunity to develop and then prepare several election campaign videos for the general. 
We obviously had to hear his opinion and his suggestions first. We did exactly that. As far as I understand, the videos did their job. We had a task from the president's administration. Uh, we needed to prepare Alexander Ivanovich Lebed for political activity. We came in, there was a uh, representative from the administration. They introduced our task and said those two young men would be preparing us. They would tell us how the government and politics are organized. We took atlases and other books from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Every day? Every day, right. For how long? For two months, I think. Golovkov reached out to me and asked me to work with Lebed. I was supposed to write texts, both articles on his behalf and the scripts for the videos that they would film. Some literary PR work for different media. I just wondered why the heck he needed me. He was great at public speaking, his Russian was eloquent. I even felt I was competing with what he could produce himself. Apparently, he was happy with my work because when I was getting paid, Golovkov told me that he said, pay the full price, and then after a pause, and give him a bonus. I'm running for president of Russia. I intend to fight for that position. At the same time, I don't rule out any coalitions. You don't? I don't. But it will depend on the conditions and the situation. When I was a soldier, everything was clear. Now, I live in a different world. Do you think his ambition to become president was real? I think not at the beginning. He was in a precarious situation, a former general living as a civilian. It's like a fish out of water, an extremely helpless creature. Different people tried to proselytize him. Rogozin tried to butter him up. Alexander Lebed is absolutely confident in his victory, and he wants to become president. He won't tell you about his other options. Lebed needed promotion. He needed to return and multiply his promotion capitalization he had in 1993 to 1994. The president's administration needed someone for that role. They found the perfect actor for that role. If you become the president of Russia, can dictatorship or an authoritarian regime develop in one way or another? I have started down this thorny path because I don't want to allow a totalitarian or authoritarian regime. I read in a Western paper, Lebed is a modern Stalin. They expect a firm hand, that's why the Stalinists are ready to vote for you. We are past the times when you could maintain the order in the country only through brute force. There is no enthusiasm like there was in the country in the 1920s and 1930s. There is no force either, so we only have our brains. Of course, Lebed was perfect for the role of Pinochet. I remember we talked about it with Golovkov. I told him, let's have him say this. The difference between me and Pinochet is 10,000 corpses and stadiums full of dead dissidents, and I don't want to make up this difference. But Golovkov said, are you crazy? Heaven forbid, what Pinochet, what corpses? No way. I have a feeling that he or his campaign managers, he had campaign managers after he got into politics, fixed his image as that of a terse soldier father. A gaffer. That's right, a gaffer the public met after Transnistria. That's what they were going for. 
That's what Vitya Shenderotvich put in three words. Drop right now. Drop right now. Yes, sir. The genre presupposes grotesque. It presupposes caricature and exaggerated features. His brutal character was overemphasized. It was like in a cartoon. But in the case of Lebed, everything was natural because he made use of his brutality himself. It wasn't innate brutality. It was pretense, of course. He was well aware of that image and worked with it in mind. And he was gifted in politics, definitely. Cameras liked him, and he did well. Behind the scenes, he was cheerful. I mean, when he was in a good mood, he was great at telling jokes. Really good at it. Military jokes, though. Yes, very often they were borderline vulgar, but he could make them funny. He had a sense of humor, so they could make you laugh. I had the impression that he was nervous, very sensitive and very narcissistic. I thought he lacked self-esteem, but he worked on that. He took public speeches extremely seriously. Extremely seriously. Every time he had to go and see his electorate, he made a tremendous psychological effort. Such meetings were a common practice back then. All in all, he was tough on the outside and kind on the inside. The movie, The Peculiarities of National Hunting, came out in 1995. Alexei Buldakov, who played the general, said he was inspired by Lebed. How much does it resemble the real Lebed? <laughs> I might not have seen much of Lebed in person, and I have never seen him tipsy or drunk. I could drink as much as I needed when I felt like hitting the bottle. Then I saw some individuals from our political and military elite. I decided not to follow in their footsteps. I wanted to be the most sober person in the country, so I quit drinking. Did he have this image of a simple guy, just like you and me, a simple Russian guy? No, no, he didn't reduce the distance. He tried to show himself as a watchful power. I'm not your pal. I'm a watchful power. So no familiarity? No, no, no. He kept his distance that let him apply his forceful qualities if they were necessary. He could do that at any moment. You would need distance for that. But he was popular with the regular folks back then. Yes, yes, he was. Because all the world had crumbled down. Local plans and quality of life went down. Financial distress also made people hope for some sort of savior and a firm hand that would appear. Have you ever had to fulfill an international duty? You know I have. I served in Afghanistan. All right, then we be of one blood, thou and I, as Mowgli said. Any war, even if it lasts 100 years, has the same ending negotiations and peace. And I've been wondering for a while, is killing thousands, making people widows, orphans, cripples, wasting the achievements of our many predecessors, is it all worth it if at the end of the day you're just going to negotiate? Maybe we should just skip this uncivilized part altogether. What do you think? Being a general with combat experience, did he really take a pacifist stance at that time or was it a political necessity? It was more of a political necessity, indicating that he was adapting to the political role. But at the same time, he was constantly going through a certain personal transformation. He saw how limited military force was. He saw both the possibilities that force could provide and the times when it reached a deadlock and led to a disaster. After having gone through a few cycles where the limitations of force became obvious, he clearly reconsidered his pre-existing views. 
He was uh, never a pacifist or a, a peacekeeper. As far as the things he said to Kisilev, he just had his own team and, and aides. Two of them ghost wrote his books. He would always say that as a military person, he didn't like war. Oftentimes, the most belligerent ones aren't those who sit in the trenches, but the ones who believe that putting on camouflage makes them a zealous patriot. Lebed didn't. Instead, he participated in many wars and conflicts and understood how valuable a human life was. He was highly intuitive and charismatic. A thing that even though he would try to negotiate it wasn't his strong suit. And if you weren't a solid piece of the bureaucratic puzzle, you didn't stand a single chance to win a legitimate fight within the system. When we were just starting out, we had this strong impression that we will play Lebed's story out strictly within the confines of the system, of that bureaucratic puzzle that worked for Yeltsin. The plan was to pull some votes away from Zyuganov during the first round to avoid the disaster everyone was dreading the most. And that would be if Zyuganov received 50% plus one vote during the first round, which would secure his victory. Who was supposed to pull the votes away from Zyuganov in the first round? According to our plan, Lebed would become a Putin 96, if you will. A patriot, a serviceman, we didn't have a Czechist at our disposal back then. The intention was to evoke the relevant emotions in Russian voters. It was my idea to join Lebed's and Yeltsin's efforts during the 96 elections, because we saw the Communist Party as a real and serious threat. And so I pitched this directly to Boris Yeltsin. Berezovsky laid a course for a soft landing. He decided that Yeltsin was weak and was doomed to give up his power step by step. On the one hand, they had a reason with the communists and entered into some kind of an agreement with them. So he began preparing for the agreement. One could track that easily. It was clear as day. And by the way, at that time, the communists were very eager to discuss the agreement with him. Well, everyone was eager to do business with him back then. Besides, he found that negotiating with the communists without any tricks up his sleeve would put him in a weak position. So he had to have something. It was probably then that he started observing Lebed. <laughs> He came up with that, and Chubais helped him play this story out. It was part of the election campaign. That's it. The deal General Alexander Lebed and I made was, I promised to provide him with the number of signatures he needed, as long as we conducted a survey two, three weeks before the elections. The one who received more votes, the one who ranked higher, would get to stay. After the survey ended, we discovered that Lebed lost and I won. Then he came to me and said, I'm going back on my promise. The exchange was witnessed by other people too. I told him, well, then you tricked me. And he said, right, I did trick you. Call it what you want. This was the point of Lebed taking part in the elections. He was propelled by Berezovsky, who intended to use Lebed to his own advantage. Had Lebed come to power, I don't think he would have been thrilled with it. 
and I believe Berezovsky would have struggled with him. The fact that Lebed was independent at heart leads me to believe he would have played his own game and wouldn't have agreed to be a pawn. Of course, Berezovsky set his sights on Lebed, seeing how he was the puppet master of politics at the time. Yet he couldn't rush it, because he understood that it was uncharted territory. And he couldn't possibly predict just how obedient the general would be when push came to shove. So I don't think that it was his biggest bet. As far as I know, your last presidential run was sponsored by Boris Berezovsky. Is that true? It's a myth perpetuated by Boris Berezovsky. He's always striving for greatness. I didn't receive a single ruble from Berezovsky. It was all lip service. During the end of the campaign, Boris Abramovich was all in. It would have been strange if he hadn't made the most of the situation. Obviously, I don't have a clue as to whether he invested his own money or stole the money from somewhere else. Did Lebed realize that he was in fact being used for a backroom deal? As you can imagine, I didn't discuss these things with him, but I think he understood it perfectly. Except they played their game while he played his own. They wanted to use him, he wanted to use them, it's commonplace in politics. Alexander Lebed takes Boris Yeltsin's recent statement regarding the fact that one of the candidates will eventually become president in 2000 personally. Having cast a vote in his own favour at polling station number 2690, he decided to decline his ride and walked home accompanied by journalists and bodyguards. After the first round of elections in 1996, he received 15% of the votes. Yeah, it's a lot. However, there was a critical difference between Yeltsin and Ziganov. Those 15% were all very loyal voters. They voted for the general and were ready to follow his political lead and answer his call. Where to next? Everyone was waiting for what he was going to say next. The country is ruled by two concepts. One is outdated and obsolete. It brought upon us a lot of bloodshed, immeasurable harm and suffering. The other is new. Yet, sadly, it's been badly released so far. But it's new, it's the future. I choose the new one. He encouraged people to vote for Yeltsin. It's hard to calculate the exact impact of those votes on Yeltsin's victory. Maybe there were other factors at play. Nevertheless, Public support for Yeltsin increased after Lebed joined his team. Lebed thought that by doing this favor, he would be appointed to the post of Minister of Defense. At least that's where his ambitions lay. He wanted to have a career in the military. I think that was exactly what he aimed for. He was in strong disagreement with Grachev, with the top brass, with the way a war should be waged and so on. But you see, they ended up appointing him Secretary of the Security Council. What is the power of the Security Council? It's a coordinating advisory authority. You draw up a document and hand it in. If it's approved, good. If it's not, even better, some power. Is that not your style? It's not. Lebed took up a respective post in the Security Council and was tasked with a demanding mission in the Caucasus. By the way, he was very critical of the Chechen war. It was another matter of severe conflict between him and Pavel Grachev ever since 1994. Pavel Grachev was one of the most outspoken war hawks at the time. He was arguably considered to have been one of the initiators of the Chechen war because it was he who promised to take Grozny with just one parachute infantry regiment. The failed New Year storm of 95 led to tremendous losses and indicated the start of a real war. By the summer of 96, Grachev had lost both the support of the military and his leverage in the behind-the-scenes struggles in the Kremlin. So when Lebet proposed to dismiss the minister, the presidential office approved the proposal with almost zero hesitation. 
The Russian leadership did nothing to settle the Chechen conflict. I put the matter to rest. I'm not afraid to die from modesty, because it's true. I personally put an end to this unnecessary bloody nonsense. In the summer of 96, the Chechen campaign ultimately reached a deadlock. An open partisan war was in full swing with ambush attacks, the wholesale destruction of whole villages, and long lists of missing people. On August 6, groups of Chechen militia that, by various estimates, consisted of up to 2,000 members, suddenly attacked Grozny. The military was caught off guard. The Chechens seized control of the city. It was obvious for everyone that another bloody assault was coming, or the Secretary of the Security Council, Libet, definitely preferred the or, which is to say, he preferred negotiations. After a short discussion in absentia, the parties met in a small Dagestani town of Khasavurt. Its name would soon become a household one. Naturally, we traveled to Makhachkala by plane. According to various southern traditions, we were invited to have a meal. So that's what we did. We stayed at the table until about midnight, and then we were supposed to take a helicopter from Makhachkala to Khasavyurt. But then Alexander Ivanovich, who was an airborne command school alumni, told the pilot, step aside, let me fly the helicopter. Excuse me, you've mentioned a meal. Were you drinking while at the table? Of course we were. Certainly. It would be impolite to do otherwise. So he was drunk when he decided to fly the helicopter? I don't know how much he had, to be honest. He must have had a couple of shots. He took the pilot's place, flew the helicopter, and, to my delight, when it was time to descend, he returned the controls back to the pilot. He gave it back to the pilot. We arrived early in the morning, the sun was coming up. Nobody was there, so we were just waiting. I asked the ambassador, or the second person, I can't remember, I asked him, where is Guldiman? Guldiman was an OSCE representative. I went to Kasavya. Lebed and his delegation were there. He asked, OK, where are the Chechens? Where are your Chechens? I told him they said the meeting was going to be held in the mountains. Lebed replied, no, it has to be held here. That was the deal. I took the helicopter, flew out to the mountains and looked for Maskhodov's car. It wasn't easy, but I found it eventually. I met with Maskhodov and told him, please, Lebed is waiting for you. Sometime later, Mr. Guldiman showed up. And then the members of the Chechen team started coming in one by one. When the negotiation started and all of us were seated, they told us, we have the document, we're familiar with it. Of course, they'd had it for a while. We don't agree, we negotiate, and so on. Lebed said to Maskadov, OK, you have your text of the document, I have mine, what are we going to do? Maskadov replied, of course, we're going to use ours as an outline. Lebed said, I prefer my text. Let's do it this way. Let's go through our text and you will point out every word that you want me to change. And while Lebed made a lot of edits, he pushed through a few important points. He said, you see, it doesn't work for Moscow. Whether it was right or wrong is another question entirely. But he surely believed that for him, it was the only possible decision in regard to internal policy. Lebed thought that he could only come back a winner, and he would only become the winner if the military action stopped. Even if it took making some concessions that probably shouldn't have been made, I think this agreement is very important. 
and valid, and it took effect, as history indicates. The issue doesn't lie in the agreement itself, but in the things that followed. The wording that was masterfully chosen, and in fact bore the core meaning, suggested that the military action be stopped and the federal troops be withdrawn from Chechnya in conjunction with the disbandment of insurgent separatist groups. Alexander Ivanovich de facto agreed to withdraw the federal troops without the disbandment of the Chechen groups, which led to completely different outcomes closer to the Second War. At the end, everyone shook hands, sat at the table. They promised to stick to the agreement and hold meetings as the need arose and so on. Many say it was a betrayal. It should have been done differently and so on. It's hard for me to judge now, but I know if it hadn't been for that agreement, a huge number of personnel would have been killed since they were in circle. You should ask the mothers of those soldiers who were there whether it was the right thing to do or not. So it's very difficult to assess the situation, especially if we consider the fact that Alexander Ivanovich wasn't an independent figure at the time. The wall of steam, that's for sure. It helps no one, so we should stop it. Everyone's exhausted by it. Will Chechnya break away from Russia that way? I don't think so. Chechnya needs Russia more than... Russia needs Chechnya. Are you in favor of holding a referendum in Chechnya if the outcome of the referendum was... It is my opinion as a presidential candidate. Now? Today I have to reconcile my opinion with the common policy. I didn't win the elections. At the time, Yeltsin did the right thing, stopping the war. Lebed had his own ambitious plans, including becoming president, and thought that they were very closely connected with stopping the war and making peace. There was some mileage in his argument. Did you meet or talk to Alexander Ivanovich after that? The last time I saw him was when the talk of him being sent off intensified. How much later was that? Three months. So, three months later. We don't keep secrets from each other in the State Duma. Everybody always talks. When I got wind of it, I called Alexander Ivanovich, came to his house and said, Alexander Ivanovich, it's my duty to notify you about what I heard through the grapevine, so be aware that a decision is coming. He looked at me and said after a pause, if they come to take me away, I'll take down three of them on the spot. <laughs> so he laughed it off. Yes, he couldn't do without a joke. Do you think it was inevitable that Yeltsin would send him off soon after the elections and the Khas of Yurt peace? Yeltsin was very sick and surrounded by people. Of course, it was clear that not very many people in his close circle were compatible with Lebed, should he become Yeltsin's successor. The security ministers that surrounded Yeltsin at the time watched everything that unfolded around Lebed closely, predicted his next move in Russian politics, and tried to interfere with him before it was too late. They wanted to thwart his rise to power and prevent him from seizing the reins. To do this, they attempted to make Boris Nikolaevich suspicious any chance they could. This is some kind of an election race in the making. The elections are going to be held in 2000. Yet now, everyone is already showing willingness to participate. Of course, we can't tolerate such circumstances anymore. 
In my opinion, it was a very logical decision. It was as logical in nature as the appointment of Lebed as a high-ranking official was illogical. By default, he certainly couldn't be the Secretary of the Security Council under Yeltsin. Levitt's appetite for political life grew stronger. As it stood, he didn't really insist on keeping his bureaucrat spot close to the president. Apparently, it was then that he started to entertain the idea of becoming a regional governor, to gain some of the experience that he very clearly lacked. After his resignation from the position of the Secretary of the Security Council, Lebed disappeared from the political agenda. But it wasn't for long. It turned out to be the calm before the next stage of his career. In the beginning of 1997, the whole country started preparing for the gubernatorial elections. Back in the day, it was a very competitive event with a lot of resources allotted, including media. According to some of the rumors circulating at the time, one of the regional governors would become the next president. His office started going over the possibilities of Lebed becoming a governor of different regions. Tula Oblast was brought up a few times, but it wasn't the most appealing option, so they ruled it out. Every now and then other regions were discussed as possible options, with rumors constantly changing. All of them were denied. Finally, on February 11, 1998, during a press conference held here at the Interfax Agency office, Lebed stated that he was going to run for governor of Krasnoyarsk Krai. It's 3,000 kilometers away from Moscow the center of Siberia, a very rich and sophisticated region which Lebed had no connections to. Of course, here in Moscow, nobody doubted that in Krasnoyarsk, Lebed would once again start his triumphant journey to the capital and the presidency. No one could have known that soon enough, the events would take a completely different turn. In the beginning of 1998, you were the head of Afontova Television Company. In February, Lebed announced that he was going to run for governor of Krasnoyarsk. What was your reaction when you first heard about it? I thought, all went well, but the devil brought ill luck. When Lebed announced the news about Krasnoyarsk cry, I, I realized that he and his team had made what was for him the right decision. But I, I knew that it would be uh, catastrophic for the region. It was clear that for Lebed it was just another springboard. What mattered most to him was the presidential race, not the governor's position. So it was evident that he was going to stay in Krasnoyarsk for a long time. This is the building of the Krasnoyarsk Krai administration. At the time, its leadership post became the subject of political infighting. It was and still is an extravagant building. Now it's under construction and the building is hidden behind a curtain that is even more extravagant. And here, as you can see, it says new metro station underway. The topic of metro construction resurfaces during each election cycle in Krasnoyarsk as it did 25 years ago because the construction of new stations is announced all the time, but for some reason it doesn't really come to fruition. A few candidates registered to stand in the 1998 election. As you already know, the outcome was unpredictable as there was real competition. But the attention, of course, was riveted on the two main candidates, Alexander Lebed and the sitting governor, Valery Zubov. He was a local resident, a professor with an academic background. The easiest way to describe him would be saying that he was a first-wave Democrat with idealistic views, a Siberian Anatoly Sobchak born in Krasnoyarsk. He easily won all the elections and had been a very popular figure until Lebed appeared, which, of course, shook things up. Despite Zubov having received approval from the presidential administration long before the elections, everything suddenly changed and came crashing down. It severely undermined Zubov's morale. He tried playing the only card he could. Lebed wasn't a local and he was going to come here just to use Krasnoyarsk as a springboard to go back to Moscow, run for president, so he didn't actually care about Krasnoyarsk cry. They tried to play this card in every possible way. In general, 
the native versus foreign conflict has always been crucial for Siberia and Krasnoyarsk. This is the trick that works. I'm not a Varangian or a Viking. I'm Russian. Do you need an interpreter to understand me? I'm Russian. A native, one could say. However, in 1998, the trick didn't work. Mainly because Lebed was such a nationwide sensation. Those who lived in the countryside, as opposed to the city folk who would vote for Zubov, were pleased with the fact that someone who had come all the way from Moscow was on TV all the time and rivaled Yeltsin himself in the elections, came here and asked for their votes. Is it true that the famous quote, drop right now, isn't actually yours? It's true. Personally, I was overcome by curiosity. I think it was the predominant sentiment shared by the region's residents. The top leaders probably saw him as a threat. But as a journalist, I understood that this was going to be interesting. They needed someone steady-handed. They wanted a strong-willed governor because the situation in the region wasn't just bad, it was terrible. People weren't getting paid, electricity and utility bills weren't being sent on time. All in all, Krasnoyarsk cry was in a very hopeless state. Zubov's governorship coincided with a, a very unfortunate period of uh, 93 to 98 which was probably the most tragic episode in the history of modern Russia's economy. Zubov's main job was to stop the privatization of state-owned enterprises and preserve production capabilities and connections in the region. They accomplished a lot, but he wasn't much of a PR expert. You know, even though the presidential elections were still fresh in the people's memory, no one had ever seen an election campaign of such a scale in the region, and no one deemed it possible. A group of political strategists arrived from Moscow. They had unlimited financial resources. They brought bags of cash. No one had ever seen anything quite like this before. Money was not an issue for them. Here are a couple of facts to provide you with an idea of just how much money was earmarked for the campaign. A few thousand members of staff worked in Lebed's office, or rather, for his campaign, including those who handed out leaflets or ran the campaign in remote districts and towns. And the main proof was that Alain Delon came to support General Lebed amid the ongoing campaign. Alain Delon's visit to Siberia. Such people have visited the city. Krasnoyarsk has become the center of political life. I don't know if everyone remembers who he is. He's a big French movie star who was universally famous in the 90s. He was in his 60s and in the twilight of his career, but still very celebrated. He came here to support Libet. The story behind it was a bit dreamlike. Libet had once been to Paris, where he met Alain Delon, and they hit it off like two true paratroopers would. It's not quite clear what Delon had to do with it, but that's beside the point. Of course, people were captivated by it. There is this nice story about Delon giving a speech in front of an audience in the open air and talking about Libet. Some passers-by were approached by a journalist from the local TV channel TVK and asked, what do you think about Delon coming here? Meanwhile, Delon was right behind their backs. They were like, what Delon? It's not him. Why? They just dressed someone up and said it's him. Why would Elaine Delon come here from France? It certainly made quite the impression. How much was Elaine Delon paid to do this? I'm no judge. I think a few million dollars. The same rumors were circulating at the time. I can confidently say one thing. He didn't come here for free. He certainly didn't. Lebed's office was said to have paid $20 million for Alan Delon's visit. I don't know, I didn't work at that office, but I believe that number to be true. I think Alan Delon wouldn't have agreed to stump for his fellow paratroopers for less. And I remembered that we had the people's favorite, Ala Borisovna Pugacheva. 
So I packed my things, called her and said, Ala Borisovna, I'm coming. I talked her into it. We arrived and the whole of Krasnoyarsk was shocked. Everyone was shocked. Moscow was shocked because no one expected that Zubov would play dirty. You came to Krasnoyarsk to work as a campaign strategist for Valery Mikhailovich Zubov, who was Lebed's rival. Yes. The sitting governor. Correct. Unfortunately, they came to their senses too late. I was not so much invited to strategize against Lebed, but to save Zubov's reputation. Was it to avoid his devastating loss in the first round? Yes. Yes, it was. Zubov didn't supervise his own campaign because he has a lot of people working for him. Somebody sent someone. But his main partner was Lushkov. Zubov's office didn't monitor it. You were the one who held the March of Hobos for Libet, right? The infamous case of Black PR. Who gave you these signs? Our bosses did. What bosses? Who were your bosses? We don't have any. This wasn't Black PR. It was a, <laughs> a funny way to get the support of a big part of intelligentsia that constituted about 15% of the population in Krasnoyarsk Krai, namely teachers and doctors. They were zooming back and forth. Um, they liked Zubov because they knew him. They saw him as a good and decent man. We corrected his mumble, but also there was Labet, a general from Moscow who'd had a successful career. They reasoned that he could get financing for the region and their life would become better. They were of two minds about who to choose, and that's why <laughs> we decided to ridicule Labet a little bit. We gathered the homeless and uh, handed out signs that said, Labet is our existential choice. <laughs> and off they went. They went across the bridge. When I asked Zubov after the elections, how come Valery Mikhailovich, the presidential office, he said, listen, two things. First, the presidential office itself wants to get rid of Lebed and send him far away because they surely didn't need him. So there were two options. He would either lose the Krasnoyarsk elections or get bogged down in the economic issues in the region later. They couldn't decide. But the main thing, as he relayed to me in a private meeting, was that the presidential office told him, we will help you if you give up this enterprise to this person, that enterprise to that person, and so on. But Zubov was an idolist and a true advocate of a strong state, so he flatly refused. That's why he didn't have any support from Moscow or the presidential administration. Who posted you to Krasnoyarsk? Who set the task for you? Or was it a contract concluded? I'm not sure how it's done. Let's put it this way. It was the, the other side of the presidential administration. The political clique in and around the Kremlin wasn't in on the economic plans. They measured everything in political categories. The red, the white, the green, the insiders, the outsiders. Labed as a governor was an outsider to them. Berezovsky talked to Zubov and suggested that they drove Norilsk Nickel to bankruptcy. Zubov was butting heads with the new owners. With Patanin and Prokhorov? Yes. Zubov refused because, according to him, it was a local economic mainstay and generally a Russian treasure. Did Berezovsky want to drive it to bankruptcy to get a hold of it? Yes, he wanted to take over. So Berezovsky told him, well then, Krasnoyarsk Krai is going to have a new governor. Then why did Patanin and Prokhorov also support Libet during the election campaign? They showed their support for everyone just in case. In reality, all oligarchs were rooting for Lebed because they belonged to the same coalition of seven bankers as Berezovsky. As a precaution, they also supported Zubov a bit. I wanted to show you what Krasnoyarsk looks like from a bird's eye view, but no such luck. It's obstructed by this haze, the so-called black sky. 
We had a whole video about this on our channel that I suggest you watch. The thing is, Krasnask is still heated with coal, and the smoke from coal furnaces and electric hot water generation plants forms a dome above the city, seeing as it's situated in a depression. It's surprising, because back then Krasnoyarsk was, and still is, one of the richest Russian regions, a donor region that has always replenished the federal budget. Why? Because the biggest industrial enterprises built in Soviet times are located here. The extreme north is home to the huge Norilsk nickel plant, and Krasnoyarsk itself can boast its Krasnoyarsk aluminum smelter. There are also a few smaller plants. When the election campaign took place at the end of the 90s, all these facilities had already been distributed among the right people as part of the privatization process and loans for share auctions. Of course, most of them were oligarchs from the capital. For instance, Norilsk Nickel had already fallen under the control of Patanin and Prokhorov. However, others were also involved in that scheme. For example, Anatoly Petrovich Bikov, the man who kept control over Krasnoyarsk aluminum smelter and many other enterprises all across the Krai in the late 90s, except for the Norilsk nickel plant. Here, nothing was done without Bikov's knowledge. He, as they say now, was the nighttime governor. You get the idea. By the way, during the 1998 election campaign, I met Anatoly Bikov and interviewed him. Actually, there weren't any red jackets, chains, or gang signs, nothing of the sort. I'd say he was an attentive, calm, and polite person. Why was, though? He still is in perfect health, albeit in a detention center. Recently, a criminal case has been launched against him over his shady dealings in the 90s, and he has been taken into custody. And he had been in the same predicament before. Right after the gubernatorial elections, he had a heated quarrel with Lebed. In order to understand why all that happened, it's important to know that Buikov supported Lebed during the election campaign. The governor arrived at 12 p.m. sharp. As tradition demands, he was greeted with bread and salt. Who did TVK belong to at the time? To Anatoly Petrovich Bikov. So who was TVK supporting in the elections? Naturally, he was supporting Lebed. Because, as you know, at the time it wasn't up to journalists to decide who to show their support for. It was the same with NTV. Now it's probably just like that on Channel 1, unfortunately. It's not up to journalists to decide how they do their job. Of course, it's hard to overestimate the role media and television in particular played in that campaign. Now let me remind you what these times were like. It was the late 90s, truly the golden age for Russian journalists and freedom of speech. How did it work? I've spoken about this many times, but let's review. There were a lot of different media outlets that belonged to different owners, some were governmental and some were privately owned. Since the interests of the private actors often go against those of the government, different media outlets sometimes describe the same event as something completely opposite. The audience can make up their own mind by comparing various points of view. This is what exactly happened during the elections in Krasnoyarsk. My understanding is that Vladimir Gusinsky, the owner of NTV at the time, wasn't directly, personally or economically interested in the campaign. That's why the journalists were able to work in accordance with the requirements of the job, be objective and give the floor to both parties. The only assignment I received from the editorial office prior to my trip to Krasnoyarsk was to make my reporting objective and interesting. It didn't take me long to realize that when you take this approach, People show you more respect than they show to those outlets that serve them. I still remember that both Libid's and Zubov's offices took to me very quickly, happily agreeing to be interviewed and clearly showing me respect. It was a very important lesson for me. It was probably then that I saw for the first time how the kind of journalistic work we embody here at Redaxia should be done. But at the same time, it's important to mention that Channel One the main outlet that belonged to Berezovsky at the time was entirely on Lebed's side and helped him run his campaign. For example, on his shows, Sergei Dorenko would regularly expose Zubov and champion Lebed. 
Zubov's office hopes to improve their candidate's public image with the arrival of the Moscow delegation, which will probably thank the residents of Krasnoyarsk for their satisfying Moscow lifestyle that is provided at the expense of Krasnoyarsk Krai's natural resources. As forgotten and unimaginable as it is now, they even held live TV debates during the campaign. Here, in Krasnoyarsk, Lebed and Zubov participated in two rounds of debates aired on a state-owned channel. NTV also wanted to organize a live meeting between Lebed and Zubov. I remember being in charge of the production. It ended up being successful. We held it on the night after the second round of the elections, I believe. Even though the sound wasn't that good and the equipment was outdated, it still went live and both candidates were on the air at the same time. I didn't lose. Alexander Ivanovich won the seat of the governor of Krasnoyarsk. But my victory lies in the fact that I stopped him from becoming the next Russian president. The first round of the gubernatorial elections was held on April 26, 1998. Lebed beat Zubov by about 10% of the votes. What's interesting is that Zubov won in Krasnoyarsk and other major cities in the region. The local companies didn't exactly lend a helping hand to Lebed. Moreover, Lebed lost the election in Krasnoyarsk itself because in 98 we had a lot of independent media companies, about uh, eight or nine channels. Out of those channels, only two or three actively worked for Lebed, I believe. The rest of them opposed him. The second round of the voting, which only Lebed and Zubov went forward to, was held on May 17th. Predictably, Lebed won, having received about 58% of the votes. On June 5, here at the Krasnier's Cry Philharmonia, Lebed was inaugurated. I, Alexander Lebed, assume the controlling power and authority over the great Krasnoyarsk Krai. What do you think were the main reasons for Lebed's victory and Zubov's defeat? Well, after all these years, I think it's obvious. First of all, Lebed was famous nationwide. Second of all, the constituency was remonstrative. Because it was the 90s, the Soviet Union had just collapsed, the economy was crumbling, etc., etc. There were a lot of protest voters, especially in rural areas of the region. Lebed just appealed to the protest voters, so the first reason was his fame, the second one has to do with the protest voters. The third reason was Berezovsky's support there and Bikov's support here. These were the three main reasons. After three or four months, the relationship between them went south. Bikov hoped that he would be able to resolve his own issues, not his personal ones, but those with the aluminium smelter. But his plan failed, because the visiting officials apparently were insatiable. All in all, they fell out and Bikov went into deep opposition to Lebed. Sometime later, he was taken to court on criminal charges and then put behind bars after having been very strangely convicted of attempted murder. He invited me to a Russian sauna where we had a conversation. He told me, tell your friend to not be so stubborn. I will make him an offer and he has to accept it because I helped him. I said, you should speak with Alexander Ivanovich on equal terms rather than give him ultimatums. He looked at me and replied, if something goes wrong, I'll do this. I immediately went to Alexander Ivanovich and said, Alexander Ivanovich, it seems we're going to war again. He turned to me and said, well, Start it, then. Soon after the elections, Lebed and Buikov had a conflict. It's a well-known fact. Your TV channel that belonged to Buikov shifted its position. We were often reprimanded for supporting Lebed, and rightfully so. But when we started opposing Lebed, we did so in all honesty. Personally, my view on Lebed hadn't changed since before the elections. I had been watching him since 1991, 
Lebed was an eminent figure. As a journalist, I attended the Congress of Russian Communities, considering that 90s politics were very kinetic. Lebed and Rogozin still stood out from the rest, and they stuck to the same ideology that Russia, and Putin in particular, is propagating now. Back then, Putin was a Democrat under Sobchak's wing, and they were in Putin's place. They talked about the Russian world and claimed that they weren't going to let the Soviet Union collapse and so on. I'd become disillusioned with Lebed before he ran for governor of Krasnoyarsk Krai. When Lebed became the governor, he scouted members for his administration with the help of different people. The majority of staff was found through Ivanishvili, who brought a few people from Rossiyski Kredit Bank. And they were open about it too. They said that they agreed to come because of their boss's promising prospects to become president. They genuinely believed that he would go on to take the presidency. Other oligarchs also sent someone in, urban madmen, people from Transnistria, thugs. There were very many thugs, those typical new Russians that wore red jackets and showed off. Some of them were deputies. Nikolai Werner, for example. That's right. I'm an angel, see? You know what an angel is? I am that. There was one eminent figure, Lyudmila Selivanova, but everyone called her Lucy. So imagine, the workers of a plant, the uh, name of which I can't remember now, went on strike. There are a lot of machine building plants and steel mills located in Krasnoyarsk. The workers were on strike because it was September the 1st, and by that time they hadn't been paid in three, four months. Lucy loved wearing fur coats. The girls that worked at our news station tried to count how many of them she had, but at some point they seemingly gave up. So Lucy Selivanova came to meet the works on strike wearing either a, a mink coat or an arctic fox one, as well as a jeweled collar and rings. The workers told her, look, we haven't been paid in three or four months. We can't even buy any books or clothes or send our kids to school. And they got hit with... There's no money, but you hang on in there. Anyway, I would like to ask all of you to be patient. When Alexander Ivanovich arrived in Krasnoyarsk, of course he didn't have a team. I assume that he didn't really trust local manpower on site. Maybe his entourage warned him that they couldn't be trusted, but gradually, after a year and a half, it was mainly local personnel who stayed. Over the course of those four years, Lebed's staff was constantly in a state of turmoil. I tried to count, but then gave up. In four years, 23 heads of the General Accounting Office, a title now known as Minister of Finance, came and went, I believe. He was a very strict and demanding leader, very demanding. He had a favorite saying that was a bit crude. Every sheep must wear its own horn. In the right context, it means that everyone has their personal responsibility. You're responsible for your side of the street. You can't shift it onto someone else, and you won't get away with it. If you have a task, you must fulfill it. Everyone in Krasnoyarsk went overboard about it. Why is he like that? Because there had been a tradition of wangling people into government jobs through the back door, based on personal connections and other circumstances that overrode anything else. Lebed would part with them very easily. I don't see anything personal about this. No one went missing. Lebed did manage to collect taxes from Norilsk Nickel, from Rusal and other industrial enterprises that started paying into the Krasnoyarsk Krai budget. Then we were able to settle the issues with salaries and started paying the workers. Of course, this was made possible thanks to Alexander Ivanovich, our team and his tough stance. 
As part of a nationwide trend, the whole country was resolving the issue of unpaid wages. So it wasn't Libid's achievement? It wasn't his achievement. The federal government was working on the issue step by step. If we talk about 97, 99, the entire country was struggling to overcome the problem. He was a puppet of a governor. You could tell that he was out of his element, judging by the people he worked with in the government and the bureaucratic machinery. There would be things that needed to be done, and he would be told why they shouldn't be done, and vice versa. He wouldn't deem certain things necessary, and they would explain to him why, using a language that was foreign to him. Some people did influence him in the beginning. Of course, one of them was Berezovsky who came here. It had to do with the fuel and energy sector, as well as with Rusal. Krasnaya's cry had a lot to be carved up. Then it had, and still does have, great industrial potential that hasn't been wasted, but rather increased. To what extent did Libet have a say in the process of this carve-up? You know, at first, I thought that their influence was quite big. But then, slowly but surely, Alexander Ivanovich somehow managed to get rid of this influence and make his own decisions. Considering the condition Russia was in, it was impossible to become a successful governor and contribute to the prosperity and material security in one select region. It was next to impossible. Besides, a common mistake made by governor-generals in Russia is that they put too much trust in their intuition and their orders, thinking that if they personally appoint someone and order them to do something, then the reality will change. But it doesn't. And if you hire someone else to do the job, thinking that you made an error of judgment, the reality still won't change. I think one of his mistakes was that he trusted too much. He was a very gullible person. This quality let him down. And the people in his circle were going about their fishy dealings behind his back. Undoubtedly, they blame it all on him. He got a slap in the face many times, pardon the slang. Um, what I mean, he received a lot of criticism. We have to admit that the people of Krasnoyarsk cry had mixed feelings about him. But I'm sure the fault rested first and foremost on his entourage. From the viewpoint of his political advancement strategy that he used to get to the pinnacle of power, it was a mistake. The specific thing about Russia is that here, top-level politics play out in two capitals. If you happen to be away from these two capitals for a long time, you lose connections and contacts. You also get excluded from the list of potential candidates for the highest positions. It was a mistake. The building of the Krasnaya's Cry administration that had seemed so ardently desirable not so long ago turned out to be a trap for Libid. When Putin gained a footing in Moscow, the situation here immediately changed, because the important people in Moscow instantly wrote Libid off. It was clear that the path to the presidency was closed, and now he had less money. I'm going to share a personal recollection. In 2001, I came to Krasnoyarsk again to cover one of Putin's visits here as president. Of course, Lebed greeted and accompanied him. It was painstakingly obvious that this man didn't fit at all into the hierarchy that was being created. Compared to the guests from Moscow who were all wearing elegant coats and dressed impeccably, Lebed was also wearing a coat, but a leather one. I'm sure it was probably a general's coat, 
But he looked like some sort of a Civil War era commissar. On the one hand, it was funny, but on the other hand, I was actually feeling sorry for him because it was evident that he didn't belong to that crowd and was never going to fit in. I remember the words I wrote for my story. I wrote, Putin was in the right place at the right time while Lebed was in Krasnoyarsk. Here in Krasnoyarsk, the matters were made worse by the fact that the pre-election charm the general exuded was now long gone. The residents started having grievances against him for a number of issues that were yet to be resolved. Of course, there were still plenty of those in the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s. And he didn't stand many chances of being re-elected for the second term, with the next election set for 2003. Lebed was essentially trapped, backed into a corner or whatnot, because he didn't have anywhere to go from here. But he was clearly going to run for governor again. Even if he decided to run, I think he wouldn't stand a chance. Not a single chance. By the end of 2001, Lebed had rapidly lost ground among people. You know, those who were making efforts to discredit him were claiming that he wouldn't be re-elected. If the integrity of the elections had been upheld and hadn't been interfered with, the people would have chosen him. They loved him. He was a hero for the people of Krasnoyarsk Krai, for its residents. He was a general that could yell or cuss someone out. This young schmuck comes to me and says, I can't, it's commercially classified information from Novosibirsk. Go fuck yourself, record this too. That's why people loved him. The part of the elites that had other plans, they wanted a different outcome, so they did everything they could to prevent him from running for a second term. But he was going to. Our people can forgive a lot of things if there's no personal greed attached. Lebed, for one, wasn't greedy. So what motivated him the most? Power. Can't the desire for power be considered greedy? It can, but we're talking about economic greed. It can. He wasn't greedy money-wise. He wasn't corrupt, and he wasn't mean-spirited. He wasn't in the habit of settling scores with journalists who really played dirty against him. In that sense, he was like Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin. So when you took jabs at him, did he not threaten you personally? He didn't. Compared to today's authorities and the way they handle journalists, Lebed did a good job in that respect. I hadn't been on leave for four years. Alexander Ivanovich didn't like it when his staff went on vacation. I asked him, you know, I'm tired. Give me at least a month. He said, no, two weeks. I said, two weeks, thank God. He was okay with that. I worked for a week after that, and on Friday I was having a well-deserved rest. I was winding down. Had you been working, you would have been on that helicopter, right? 100%. I was supposed to be there. There was a seat booked for me. Today, Alexander Lebed, the governor of Krasnoyarsk Krai, has been killed in an MI-8 helicopter crash. In the early hours of April 28, 2002, an MI-8 helicopter took off from the governor's Sosny residence here in Krasnoyarsk. Lebed, 18 companions, including journalists and three members of the crew, were aboard. They were going to attend the opening of a new ski trail in the eastern Cyan. That day, the visibility was low, which aircraft pilots refer to as instrument meteorological conditions, meaning that it was required to fly primarily by referencing instruments. The MI-8 isn't really designed for such conditions, but they proceeded with the flight regardless. Just about two kilometers away from their destination point, the helicopter hit electric lines and crashed to the ground. Eight people died instantly. Severely injured, General Lebed was rushed to the hospital where he passed away. I'm sorry, but to assume that the team had outdated maps and didn't notice the power lines, the crew members were professionals. 
So you think there was something else at play there? I can venture a guess that there was something else at play. I can make an assumption. I think that it was just an accident. I don't see how it could have been sabotaged. Although there was something eerie about it, because right before the accident, Lebet had settled the bill with his bodyguards. I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I don't think it happened because somebody wanted to take him out. My understanding is that it was a tragic accident. We have the court decision, the uh, witnesses' statements. The emergencies ministry special committee led by Shogo inspected the site. The court found that the accident was caused by an error on the helicopter commander's part. According to the official statement upheld by the court, it was the crew's error that led to the crash. They ignored the challenging weather conditions and didn't notice the power lines. The helicopter's commander, Tahir Akhmerov, didn't plead guilty. He maintained that it was a coordinated terrorist attack. In some interviews, he stated that someone might have subtly tampered with the electronics. In others, he said that the flight altitude had been calculated incorrectly. Then he also insisted they had been equipped with incorrect maps. All in all, he strongly deflected the blame. Of course, there are a plethora of alternative theories which suggest that Libet was assassinated. The helicopter was mined with the explosives secured on the rotor wings. Boris Berezovsky, in particular, theorized that it might have been an assassination. But it's important to mention that this statement came after he'd already had a falling out with Putin, moved abroad and started leveling harsh criticism and accusations at Putin. To be honest, I don't really want to delve deeper into the mind helicopter conspiracies because, frankly speaking, this theory isn't backed by any evidence that isn't speculative and hypothetical. There is yet another theory suggesting that Lebet himself could have interfered in the helicopter's operation. According to Vladimir Lukin, he would often take matters into his own hands, for example, on their way to Khasavyurt. But that's a different story. There are a lot of rumors and circumstantial evidence on the internet implying that during the flight, Lebed ordered the crew to ignore the bad weather conditions and continue with the flight. But again, there's no proof. We used to spend a lot of time on planes, helicopters and in cars. There wasn't a single plane or helicopter flight where Alexander Ivanovich would approach the pilots and take over the controls. He never gave orders to any commander of any aircraft. Those rumors about him instructing the commander on what to do and how to fly are all lies. Not so long ago, I myself was a private pilot and also flew a helicopter. It wasn't as big as an MI-8, but still. I can say that hitting power lines is one of the most common causes of accidents in general aviation, especially when it comes to helicopters. Usually, it happens to experienced pilots that are self-confident enough to think that they can bend the rules a bit in regard to flying in poor weather conditions. In most cases, accidents occur in such conditions specifically because if the weather is poor, a pilot who flies by visual references has to keep close to the ground and can easily miss power lines. It's easy to do so if you're sitting in the cockpit. You're most likely to miss the power lines. That's why all amateur pilots are taught to look for power line poles and not the lines themselves. But if you fail to notice the poles, there's nothing that can save you from hitting the lines at such an altitude. I personally know a few experienced pilots who hit the lines and crashed in these exact circumstances. That's why this version seems quite plausible to me. Tahir Akhmerov was sentenced to four years in a minimum security prison camp. He served two years and was released on parole, never admitting his guilt.
On April 29, 2002, in the Krasnaya's Cry Philharmonia, where he had been inaugurated just four years prior, a memorial service was held for Libid. About 50,000 Krasnaya's residents were in attendance. Putin, Berezovsky, and even Alain Delon offered their condolences. The family decided to bury Libid in the Novodevichy Cemetery in Moscow, and the memorial service in the capital was held the next day, April 30th. The creme de la creme of Moscow all gathered there. Boris Nemtsov, who also attended the service, said that life wouldn't be so fun without Libid, because he was such an eminent and talented person, and proved to be so not only in life, but in death. He is a fighter. He spent all his life fighting. Sometimes he would win, sometimes he would lose. But the fact that fate had him go like that proves that he was a fighter till the end. His death can only make you feel sorry for him. I don't think he got to fully realize his historical potential. Other than that, it was a classic revolutionary period drama. Revolution spares neither its supporters nor its opposers. Do you think he had a real chance of becoming the president of Russia at any time? Anyone probably has a chance, always. But after he stopped being part of the Russian authorities, maybe if he had kept the role of Yeltsin's junior partner, he might have become his successor. But history knows no ifs. There was never an if. So we'll never know. If you can't buddy up to them, you should become the head of an alternative system, which was next to impossible, even in the 90s. But if you had some exceptional talents of manipulation, you could at least try to do something. But he didn't want to play this game either, so he was a self-contained swan that flew by himself, isolated from the flock. But you see, a swan on its own. Not every swan can fly to the middle of the Dnieper. So friends, here we are. As usual, on this channel, you're free to draw your own conclusions. I decided to finish this episode at the same place we started. Exactly where my journalistic career kicked off. You know, as I was filming this episode, I realized that I had surely been influenced by General Lebed's charm for the past 25 years. He had made a lasting impression on me back in 98. The job of a journalist has a drawback called disillusionment. When you start digging through documents and talking to people, it turns out that in reality, things were different or not exactly the way you'd imagine or even want them to be. You start seeing cold and calculated people who were hiding behind polished looks and fulfilling their own political or financial plans, often doing so ruthlessly and in cold blood. I get that. It's what it is. It's not black and white, as we all know. But you know, I've come to realize that the power of a myth in political discourse shouldn't be underestimated. Because, at the end of the day, this whole story hinges on myth. As time goes by, a myth can become a fact, as far as politics are concerned. In that respect, the story of a general who became a peacemaker, prevented two wars and said, let's negotiate, is a powerful myth not only in respect to the new reality of today. It's been Redaxia. Please leave your comments and likes down below and subscribe to our channel. See you soon.